This episode is sponsored by Lockheed Martin. At Lockheed Martin, veterans are at the center of everything they do. In fact, one in five of their employees has served in uniform. Lockheed Martin is proud to help men and women like you successfully transition into civilian careers. Join Lockheed Martin and you will find opportunities to take on the same kind of long-term, challenging assignments you tackled while in the military. Whether you're on active duty, transitioning, or already embarking on your civilian career, Lockheed Martin's Military Connect is your online community for professional support. You can find out more at LockheedMartin.BraveNew.com. That's LockheedMartin.BraveNew.com. Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and my goal is to help military veterans figure out what they want to do after their military service and succeed in their military career. Today's is episode number 223 with Peter Docker. Give yourself permission. Let me explain. Quite often we find ourselves, particularly at moments of transition, where um, we feel we need to get immediately into action and we don't give ourselves time to reflect. Reflect on who we are, what we stand for, and what we believe. And quite often in the military, regardless of our rank or position, we've had people given us permission, implied or explicit. You know, go off on leave, stand down, do this, do that. And when you leave, no, you no longer have that person or those people giving you permission to do things. You have to give yourself permission. And one of the most valuable things to do is to give yourself permission to pause and reflect on what you stand for, who you are, put words around your why. Because then when you do get into action again on the what, you'll get into action heading in the right direction. Well, today's interview was a real privilege for me. I saw Simon Sinek's TED Talk years ago called Start With Why, and it was it's had a major impact on both my professional and my personal life. Uh, if you have not seen this 20-minute video, you really owe it to yourself to check it out, as well as Simon's book, Start With Why. My guest today is Simon's right-hand man and works with leaders throughout the world, helping them figure out uh, a purpose uh, for their life and how to pursue that purpose most efficiently. Many of the guests that I've had on the show have talked about how difficult it is to find a new purpose after their military service. So this interview is exactly in line with helping you identify and pursue that new purpose. I think you'll find it really uplifting and very encouraging. As always at beyondtheuniform.io, you'll find over 220 episodes just like this, as well as our coaching program, which if you you like this interview, I highly recommend you check out our coaching program, which pairs you with a one-on-one subsidized professional coach to help you figure out your next career move. So with that, let's dive in to my conversation with Peter. Well, joining me today in Burford, Oxfordshire is Peter Docker. Peter, welcome, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Delighted to be here. Thanks for having me, Justin. Um, I want to give our listeners a very abbreviated bio. Uh, Peter is part of the Start With Why team, where he helps individuals and organizations harness the power of why. The result is extraordinary cultures and sustainable high performance. Peter is the co-author of Find Your Why, a practical guide on how to discover the why for any individual team or organization. He also, he's also a guide of the online why discovery course. Uh, Peter's career has included being an international negotiator, leading an aviation training and standards organization, teaching postgraduates at the UK's Defence College, and leading multi-billion dollar international procurement projects. Standing shoulder to shoulder with the Start With Why team since 2011, Peter works with organizations around the world to help them articulate their purpose educate their leaders, and create cultures where each individual thrive. So, uh, Peter, maybe to, to start things off, um, when you talk with someone about the work that, that you do, how, how do you explain your work? Um, sorry, I'm just recovering from all those watts, and that is <laughs> not often I hear it, it all read out like that. Um, how do I explain the work I do? Well, we're moving towards the vision of the world where everyone gets up inspired 
feels safe whilst they're at work and returns home each day feeling fulfilled by the work they do. So I work shoulder to shoulder with Simon Sinek. Um, as you mentioned there, we co-wrote the book uh, Find Your Why with my dear friend David Mead. And uh, we're all about sharing the ideas and also helping people to implement them. And that's at every level, mm. uh, at an individual level and also up to some of the biggest companies you can imagine. So our work takes us all over the world. Um, it's a great privilege to share these ideas through the medium of keynote talks or workshops, longer term partnerships or whatever it happens to be. Uh, it's, it's an absolute, absolute joy doing that. So uh, um, that's what it looks like for me. That's what my life consists of at the moment. And, and what led you from the Royal Air Force to, to this work? Like, how did you even get exposed to this and to be part of the team? Well, all those things that you mentioned in the intro there, all the things I've done, the majority of them has been part of um, my time in the, the Royal Air Force. Uh, I spent 25 years uh, in the Air Force. Um, and then after those 25 years, I thought, there's more I can do. The, the military was contracting, and so by the time you've served 25 years, I, I'd reached a fairly senior level and opportunities were drawing down. So. I decided to leave and I joined a, a consultancy which had got nothing to do with aviation. I used to be a pilot, nothing to do with the military, but had everything to do with how people work together and how they take care of one another. I spent three years working places in like Kazakhstan, the Middle East, Africa, in high risk projects such as uh, oil and gas, mining, construction. And by high risk, I mean those where people tended to get killed or injured. Um, and the work we did was introducing people to a way of leading and taking care of one another. So not only were the projects very successful, measured by the time it took them to get to the finish line, but also everyone went home safe every day. And it was during my three years there that I saw Simon's very famous TED Talk uh, of 2009, Start With Why?, I remember exactly where I was when I saw it for the first time. Mm. I was sitting in the, the second chair from the end in the boardroom of the company where I was working at the time. And I thought, that's, that's it. That's put into words what I've always felt. So about three months later, uh, I resigned from my job, which was seen as perhaps a very illogical thing to do because it was at the height of the recession. It was a well-paid job, great benefits, all those good things. And I went home and spent about four and a half months writing down everything I'd learned through all the different things I'd done in my life. And it was during that time that I reached out to Simon and his team consisted of himself, a wonderful lady who's still with us, Kim Harrison, Monique, who, uh, uh, supports him on a daily basis and David Meads, the co-author of Find Your Why, he was answering emails part-time for Simon, all of the requests and information that came in and he saw my email and he said there was something different about it and long story short, it meant that Simon and I met up in London a few months later mm. um, and we just chatted over breakfast and what characterised that meeting above all else was that Neither of us were there to get anything. We were there to give, to share ideas and share a common belief. And from that, the, the relationship just evolved really organically. And a few months later, in the most staggering demonstration of trust I've ever experienced, Simon asked me to start speaking on his behalf and taking his message around the world. And that was staggering because he'd built up quite a following and reputation. He was letting me into that. Um, the other thing that made it staggering was that he'd never heard me speak mm. at that stage. In fact, the first time he heard me speak was when we were on tour together in Australia and New Zealand uh, about 18 months ago. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we came to be. But it was nothing, we didn't drive anything. It was just a relationship that evolved and he now refers to to me and David Mead as is how guys as it were to his why so um, that's what we we do we bring his ideas to life we add some of our own 
and we help people bring them into their lives. Mm. And and for listeners in the show notes, I'll add a link to um, the now infamous TED Talk that um, Simon gave. I'll, I'll add links to both books. But um, maybe just so we have a foundation for the conversation, how would you... Um, how would you briefly explain the uh, the foundation of Simon and, and your work in, in, in the work that you do with organizations? Sure. Well, the starting idea is this thing we call the golden circle, um, which describes how all of us, be it individuals or businesses, we operate on three levels. There's what we do, there's how we do it, and there's why we do it. So what we do, everybody knows that, you know, it's the product or service or the, the thing that you're at work on when you, you go to work each day. We all know what that is. We can talk about it. Then we have how we bring that to life, which is what makes us different or special. And generally we talk about our, our guiding principles or what drives us, our values. Yeah. Um, but not many people can talk about why it is they do what they do and by why uh, we're using the term in a very specific way. We're using it as shorthand for what's our higher purpose? What's our just cause? Why do we get out of bed each day? And why should anybody care about that? As a consequence, most of us think, act, and communicate. They start with, we start with what we do and then go to how, and then it all fizzles off. Um, you know, I'm a software developer. Um, how I do that is I think differently, or whatever it is. But then it tails off. But the inspired people, the inspired organizations, they think, act, and communicate, starting with why it is they do what they do. And when we do that, it opens up the possibility of people feeling inspired and wanting to support us if they believe that too. It generates things such as trust and loyalty. Um, and it, it's how we operate at an individual level just when we're choosing who's going to be our friend or not. You know, All that Simon did... Um, was put it into simple language that everyone can understand. And when an idea is simple, then people can understand it, they remember it, uh, and then they share it, and then it takes hold. So that's the brilliance of Simon's Golden Circle. That's mm. what we're talking about. And, and could you give, um, I know that in the book you give a bunch of examples, but uh, whether it's Apple or just any, any company that you think is relevant, an example of what the, the company's why might be? Sure. Um, well, let's talk about companies and then I'll talk about um, uh, individual ones yep. as well because that, that's, that applies equally. Mm -hmm. So, you know, companies that are, are why-based, and by why-based we're talking about companies that use their why, their just cause, their higher purpose as the starting point for everything they do. So, yes, Apple is, is one. Um, we've got. Um, what, what would be ex an example of like Apple's why? Just kind of like so people hear okay. that sentence. Yep. So you know what Apple stands for when they are at their best is thinking differently, challenging the status quo. Mm. How they do that is that they make products that are beautifully designed, wonderfully manufactured, and easy to use. They just happen to to make computers, but also watches and iPhones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's what drives them. Um, we've got companies like Lego. Uh, you know, Lego, the little plastic bricks, mm -hmm. you know, what what they stand for is inspiring the builders of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know, um, how they do that is through fun and play. They just happen to make little plastic bricks. I, I love in both of those examples. I think one of the things that resonated me with, with that is, it, let's just take the Apple example. If you had asked me to describe what Apple does, let's say 10, 15 years ago, I'd say, well, Apple makes computers. And I can mm. see that if, if you went into it, if you were at Apple and that was how you identified what you're doing, we would never have had the iPod, we'd never have the, the, the iPhone or any of these things. And I yeah. think what's so powerful of distilling it down to the why, it really opens them up to do so many different things rather than just being stuck in one track. And I think that that's, that's what made sense for me, too, on an individual level of, especially as I think of people listening to this that might be on active duty in the military, um, it's probably a strong part of their identity. And if they think of themselves in their terms of like, I am a submarine driver or I am a pilot or these other things, that is a component yeah. of who they are. But that might um, might limit their thinking of what might be next for them or what might be central to who they are. 
Absolutely. Mm. Um, and just building on, on that, because you raise a very important point. Mm. Um, I like to keep it simple. And what I'm about to say, it cannot be simpler than this. <laughs> there are only two things in this world. Only two. There is content and there is context. Content is the stuff that we do, the things that we say, the things that we're at work on. But content has got no meaning whatsoever without context. Mm. Context is what gives meaning to the content. It's like when we were young, we had jigsaw puzzles. Yeah? The content was all the pieces of jigsaw on the table, but that didn't make any, those didn't make any sense whatsoever until we saw the context, the picture on the box. Mm -hmm. Then we knew how to fit those pieces of jigsaw puzzle together. Mm -hmm. And I had a very challenging puzzle when I was young, whereby if you turn those p puzzle pieces over, there was a different picture on the other side. Mm. And it's only when you saw the other picture on the back of the box that those pieces made sense again. And when we start to talk about why, our why is like the context. It's the picture on the box, mm. yeah? Mm -hmm. And I think this is what makes it so powerful to your point. We can look at all the different puzzle pieces, all the different what's, if you like, that we can do in life. But it's only if they fit together in some way that they take on a really powerful meaning. And when we've been focused on a particular job, such as particularly in the military or being a first responder um, in communities, for for example, we we are driven to do that or we are inspired to do that because of a higher purpose. We're in service of that higher purpose, even if we don't naturally speak about it. But that's almost like a given. Mm -hmm. um, and we get focused then on delivering that through the what. Mm. And the challenge is that when we leave that community, we can then start to go in search of other, other jigsaw puzzle pieces, mm. other what's. But without understanding, without being able to put into words the context, the picture on the box, those what's have no meaning whatsoever. Mm. I'll give you a very simple example just quickly. Um, I was a pilot. Um, for much of my time in the military and many of my colleagues when they left they went to fly commercial aircraft now some of them are quite happy doing that but for many of them they're not happy what they're doing is essentially the same they're flying an airplane mm -hmm. but when you move from the military to the civilian environment the context is completely different the the purpose has changed and you're no longer in service of something much higher than yourself, perhaps. Um, you know, I often get asked if I still fly as a pilot. No, I don't. You know, going and hiring an airplane and flying from A to B, that was, you know, it, it didn't have enough context for me. When you're flying a mission in service of something else, that gave meaning to using your skills in a particular way mm. um, and your professionalism. And yes, it applies to flying, but it applies to anything else too. So I think this is the key message here, that when we make a life transition, particularly from a community that is so tight-knit as the military and going into the civilian world, we tend to focus on those what's. But actually, we need to give ourselves time to think about the context and focus on the why, mm -hmm. because that will open up many more possible what's that we could do, and they'll make sense and will feel fulfilled and get joy from the work that we do. I, I love that. I mean, I think, um, you know, in the 200 plus interviews I've done with veterans, one of the things that you said that seems consistent for me is that um, so many of these men and women are driven by a, a very strong and very high purpose of yep. um, service to others, of protection, of, um, uh, you know, very, very lofty ideals. And then when they transition out of the military, there is this uh, this almost like this vacancy of like what is their purpose. Yeah. And and when you're saying that, it makes me feel like almost like um, the process you're outlining is letting people uh, anticipate that change and define for themselves what their why is, independent of the military and what they're doing, and owning that personal mission, owning that personal why. And then Absolutely. using that as a lens to view opportunities through which to see, like, is this consistent with my why? Is this consistent before I even get to the what or the how? Is this, you know, aligned with what's deeply yeah. tied to me as my personal why? That's spot on, mm -hmm. Justin. You know, and just to be clear, 
we each have a why and we have one why only mm. it doesn't change mm-hmm. you know it's fully formed by the time we're in our late teens mm-hmm. or at most early 20s um what we do in life can change many many times and some people can get mixed up between what they do and why they do it mm-hmm. um particularly when we're we're in the military and um, because we're we're so focused we're in a, a team we feel safe you know the guys at the left of us guys at the right right of us looking after us because we do exactly the same for them Mm. um and we think that the military is our why no it's just a what um and the opportunity is to be able to put into words the why the context which is in a single sentence Mm -hmm. and then it opens up other opportunities in terms of what i mean to give you an example my why is to enable my why is to enable people to be extraordinary so that they can do extraordinary things. Mm. Um, now, extraordinary can mean great things, large things, down to the smallest things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I was growing up, I grew up with people of my parents' generation who were severely disabled. One of them actually was a former Royal Marine Commando who fought in the Malayan jungles during the Second World War. And he had chronic arthritis in his legs and couldn't walk very much at all. And I remember as a 12, 14 year old uh, boy, um, we were great mates and I would help him uh, get around to get over his lack of mobility so as he could bring out the extraordinary person he was. And he was a remarkable character, Mm. uh, long since passed away. But I remember him deeply for who he was. And so I enabled him. Um, because I gave him legs, in effect. I gave him mobility. Um, and when I look through all the different what's I've done in my life, all those things that you mentioned on the intro there, um, the times when I felt most fulfilled, most inspired, most empowered, was when they have had an element of enabling others to do their extraordinary things. That's what fires me up. So. You know, back when I was a pilot, I, I flew air refueling aircraft. Mm. Um, and that was about enabling the fast jet guys, the fighter guys, to do their work, mm-hmm. um, which during the Gulf War was primarily about supporting our people on the ground, um, be they wearing an American uniform or British or Australian, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so your why is this context that acts as the golden thread to pull together everything that makes you feel fulfilled and fired up. Mm. And that's why it's such a useful tool, particularly at a time of transition. I, I love that too, because um, I, your, your why resonates with me. And then I also see how this opens up a, a universe of possible what's. And what I think is even more profound is um, it seems like that why can imbue so many different types of occupations with a purpose and a mission and almost elevate it. Like I could see, I could see someone with that very same why running a restaurant and just wanting to be the best manager to let all of their employees be extraordinary and do extraordinary things in the world. But that to me seems so much more powerful than just someone who's, Oh, I, I, I run a restaurant, you know, no, like you can, you can have a purpose in anything that you do, but the the power of uncovering it and articulating it to yourself so that you can really um, embody that in whatever you're doing. I I completely agree. And uh, just pick up on your point there. Um, The why is very helpful when we're looking for um, work or anything in life that we want to do. Um, And, if we're currently in a a particular job, it can give fresh meaning to the work that we're doing for the very reason that you've just described. And the thing that I I need to emphasize as well is that your why is not something made up, it's not even aspirational. Mm. Um, It comes from our past and that's what makes it authentic. And this applies to companies as well as to us as individuals. But, you know, that story I gave you about um, the person, I'll give him a name, He's, his name is Frank, mm. um, remarkable chap. Um, when we think back to specific times in our life when we felt fulfilled 
and were in flow, um, loving what we were doing. And quite often these aren't huge moments, but they were meaningful moments. We remember them because at the time it triggered an emotion mm. in us. And emotions are triggered when we experience something that resonates with the values that we hold, the belief that we hold, or they rub up against the values that we hold or the beliefs that we hold. And so when we identify these stories, this is the why discovery process. When we identify these stories, we see a theme or themes that start to flow through all of those high points and further proved, if you like, by the, the, the low points as well, which run counter to, to those feelings. And that then leads us to our why. But this is what makes it authentic because it comes from our past. It can then act as a springboard to our future because it can then, to your point earlier, Justin, it can act as a filter for the way we see the world mm. and the things that we choose to do in the world. Mm. Um, but that's what makes it authentic. I love that. And I love the sense of power behind the emotion driving mm. this and the leverage that that gives someone to to be able to do great things. And, you know, yeah. obviously for listeners to, to check out the TED Talk and these books, I'm wondering, um, maybe just starting with an individual, um, do you have a, either an exercise or a recommendation? I, I'm, I'm mentally struggling with how to pose this because obviously in your work, you know, you work with people, I'm imagining, over an extended period of time and you're, you know, you have a very set process. So I'm not trying to uncover a uh, shortcut here, but I'm also trying to, for listeners, give them something that they could take away today to start chipping away at what their why is. And I'm wondering if anything comes to mind as um, something that they could take on either as a homework assignment or as, or as a thought exercise right now to start to make progress towards uncovering what their, their why is. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So um, two things. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing you can do is to sit down and think of specific stories from your past that um, are meaningful to you. Now, by specific, we mean specific in terms of time, place, or people who are involved. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example of a generic and then a specific story. So someone might say, um, I always loved when we were kids, we'd go to our grandparents' place at Christmas time, and I... I, I just love being with my grandparents. Mm. Yeah, great. We all get it. Um, but that doesn't have the power. I would then say to them, okay, tell me your specific time. What are those occasions that you remember most? And then someone might say, well, actually, there's this one particular Christmas time when um, it was just me and my granddad. And I was sat on my granddad's knee. Um, I was about six years old. And we were sat on the stairs in their, their home. And he was just telling me about how it was for him when he was growing up. Okay, now, that's a specific moment, a specific story. And we dig deeper into the reason that the person remembered that story. And we would ask questions. We say that the roots of the why is through the what. If I was, ask you, if I was to ask you, why do you remember that particular story? Um, it actually activates a part of the brain called the limbic brain, which is responsible for all feelings and all human behavior, but has got no capacity for language. Hmm. And so we struggle to answer the why question. If, however, I was to ask you, what is it hmm. about that particular story you told me that made it so important to you? That what question activates the part of the brain called the neocortex, which is responsible, amongst other things, for language. And so we can start talking about it, and that then starts to enable us to access the limbic brain and get to the real feelings mm. um so that's the first thing that people can do mm. think about those stories the second thing and you can download this for free off the start with why website it's called a friends exercise it's also in the back of the find your why book as well so the friends exercise is very simply um when you've got a quiet moment with one of your best friends perhaps lifelong friend Sit down and ask them, why are you friends with me? And uh, the response will probably be along the lines of, well, don't make so daft, you know. Well, <laughs> well you're my mate, you know. Mm -hmm. But keep, persevere. And say, no, really, 
why are you friends with me? What is it that has meant that we've been friends for all these years? And they will start talking about, well, you know, you're there for me, you're, you're, you're trustworthy, you say what you, you mean, or whatever. All this stuff, they'll, they'll start talking about you. Mm. But then there will be a switch. If you persevere, there will be a switch. And that switch is when that person starts talking about how you make them feel. And that's when you start to get to the root of who you are as an individual and what you mean to others. Mm. Um, we're all biologically hardwired to serve others. You know, this is how as a species 50,000 years ago, we not only survived, we thrived. It's because we came together in groups called tribes. And a tribe was a group of people who believed in the same thing. In other mm. words, they had a similar why. And back then it meant that we could literally sleep at night because others were watching over us. Mm. Now, we haven't changed at a biological level in 50,000 years. And what happened back then was that chemicals were released in us that supported those actions that we took that kept us together as a group, as a tribe. There are chemicals called serotonin and oxytocin, which are released when we do things in service of others, in service of a higher purpose, mm. because it keeps the tribe together. And those chemicals are still at play today. We are emotional animals. We react to those emotions. And the way we get that reaction is through those chemicals that are released in our brain. And this is the reason why it feels good when we're with people such as our friends who believe what we believe, have similar guiding principles, a similar view in life. It's our tribe. Mm -hmm. And we do things instinctively to keep that tribe together, to stay friends. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we do that, we're driven to do that because it releases chemicals in our brain which actually give this, gives us the feeling of happiness it's a chemical reaction in our brain mm -hmm. yeah? so coming back specifically to people who have spent their life in very overt service in the military actually we get hooked on it mm. it's, we become addicted to it being in service of others and so when we leave the military and make that transition, we also have to find another way of releasing those chemicals, mm. even though we don't know it. Mm -hmm. And so this comes back to the reason it's really helpful to discover our why. Mm -hmm. so then we've got a way of acting on it because it's in words, then we can action it, and we can find our tribe, mm -hmm. be it our group of friends, broadening that, or the people we're going to work with. Um, we can be in service of a higher purpose, and then we get those chemicals released into our body. It's very simple biology. I, I, I appreciate that explanation, too. I'm, I'm, I'm remembering so many of the interviews I've done where the veteran uh, expresses uh, most often guilt, uh, guilt of that they're not serving in that same capacity or guilt that, yeah. that, um, that others are still out there serving. And yeah. when you explain in those terms, I imagine that part of at least what's going on is that, that, that you know, they're missing that, that, that chemical that they experienced in the military. And, and why I think this is important, and correct me if I'm misunderstanding this, but it seems like if, if listeners can define their own why, if they can, you know, open up their to to their own new purpose and sense of why, that's something that can go along with them in life, and they can find other ways to serve that, that might not be the same. What they might not be in the military, they might not be wearing a uniform, and yet they still could be having an impact on whatever that tribe is, and that tribe could be still their country, it could be their family, it could be their local community. I'm thinking of um, a gentleman I interviewed recently, Mike Stedman, who opened up a um, ironbound boxing, this boxing community to help low-income kids out of poverty through boxing and through exercise. And, I, and it's such a brilliant why and that like I, I can imagine him getting that same rush of service does it have much overlap with what he did in the military not really and yet it is still serving in a very powerful way and so i love the power of what you're talking about as a way of um avoiding that sense of lack of purpose and guilt mm. that so many people i've interviewed have experienced for at least uh, a part of that transition time 
I I agree totally. You know, what you're saying about um, the, the chap who opened up the boxing club, actually, it, it's absolutely in tune, I would say, with what he did in the military mm-hmm. in the, from a why perspective. Um, and I, I go a step further as well, and I think this is important to mention. Um, many people, including myself, when they've left the military, they have had some mental challenges. Mm-hmm. And um, I had depression, some may have seen it as PTSD um, and guilt, and that can weigh heavily on you, uh, as many people out there will recognize. And the why gives you a way of getting out of that hole. I remember a very particular moment um, a couple of years ago, and I was feeling pretty heavy weighted depression on my shoulders and that afternoon I had a coaching call just over the phone with someone in another country I'd made that commitment a while back but I really didn't feel up to it but I made myself I thought look my why is about enabling other people I gotta do this you know and I hopped on that call and of course by the end of that call I felt so much better Hmm. because I was able to bring something to that other person um, I was able to live my why. It released oxytocin into my system, which elevates your mood um, and does lots of other great things to your system too. So I think this is really important because many people leaving the military feel very lost and isolated or can do. Mm-hmm. And a why is a way of getting back into action mm-hmm. in a meaningful way. It gives you it gives you something to follow mm-hmm. when you can feel quite lost, mm. and that's a very empowering thing to have in your belt. It really is. I love it. Well, I know we're approaching the end of our time together, and I always like to just reserve the last question to be much more open-ended, which is, um, what have we not covered today that you want to make sure listeners know before we wrap up? Give yourself permission. Let me explain. Quite often, we find ourselves, particularly at moments of transition, where um, we feel we need to get immediately into action and we don't give ourselves time to reflect. Reflect on who we are, what we stand for and what we believe. And quite often in the military, regardless of our rank or position, we've had people given us permission, implied or explicit, you know, go off on leave, stand Mm -hmm. down, do this, do that. And when you leave, no, you no longer have that person or those people giving you permission to do things. You have to give yourself permission. And one of the most valuable things to do is to give yourself permission to pause and reflect on what you stand for, who you are, put words around your why. Because then when you do get into action again on the what, you'll get into action heading in the right direction Mm. and you'll find something that's fulfilling and will fill the gap and more that was left when you moved on from the military. Mm. Give yourself permission. I love it. I, I, Imagine I'm not alone amongst uh, people who served in the military in this, but I I definitely gravitate toward execution, action, and tactics. And I'm always, you know, very quick to move towards that. And one of the things that stands out for me when you said that is is making some space, giving some pause, Mm -hmm. letting, letting the dust settle a little bit, taking a breath. And I'm reminded of all the times that I've, eagerly run off at 100 miles an hour in the opposite direction and my my wife has found a way to counter that in me by saying uh, it takes time to save time which i always get a little bit frustrated when she says that but it, it's true of um you know giving yourself permission to to do what for me is not as natural to sit down to do mm. the, the heavy lifting emotionally and mentally of 
I, I keep on picturing when you're talking about this, like the, a paleontologist uncovering a dinosaur of just that the gentle brushing that you that I saw in those videos as a kid of, of just brushing away the sand and uncovering the skeleton underneath. And I, I picture it similarly of just taking time to go through the um, the friend exercise that you talked about and to go through the um, thinking of the stories that you talked about and yeah. um, and taking time to watch the TED Talk and, and read the, these books as well and just giving that space to really figure out mm. where our engine is and where where we derive that power from. And while that takes more time and takes more effort, it just aligns you to just go full throttle and, and knowing that you're in the right direction. And I, I think that's just a, a beautiful way, way of putting it, of just giving yourself permission to do that. Absolutely. You know, sometimes we're running so fast, we, we forget that if we stop for a moment and get a bike, we can go even quicker. <laughs> yeah. And, and something you just said, uh, I'd like to give a bonus answer to your mm, question. Yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. Because I think it's the most one of the most important things, if not the most important thing I, I've learned since leaving the military. And it's this, when we were in the military, as you've just mentioned, we we're very focused on getting things done. Mm -hmm. You know, we're about action, causing things to happen. Mm -hmm. That's what we're about in the military. We cause things to happen. And that's how we're, we're trained, that's how we're, we're attuned. What I've learned though, since leaving the military, is the value of allowing things to happen. Mm. And this is where we have a focus on, instead of pushing things along, taking a step back and creating a space into which others can step. And some of the most meaningful relationships, mm. such as with Simon Sinek and the team, and some of the most meaningful work we've done has been when we've given space to allow it to grow and to allow others to step in and support us who are inspired by the cause, whatever it is. So, yeah, dwell and pause on allowing things to happen mm. rather than just having a focus on causing things to happen. And chances are, when you allow things to happen, what emerges is going to have deeper roots mm. and it's going to stay longer with you and grow into something that's much more sustainable and much more fulfilling than it would otherwise be. Mm. That's great. Well, thank you so much for, first of all, for the work you do. I, I'm reminded of, I was at a um, meditation retreat a few years ago, and at the time I was trying to figure out my next career move and was struggling between startups and doing something nonprofit related. And the, the advice that the person gave me, is she said, do, do what makes you feel alive because the world needs more people who are fully alive in whatever they're doing. And the impression I get is that you have found that, that calling that makes you feel fully alive. So thank you for the work you do, but also thank you for taking the time to speak with us in the audience today. You're most welcome. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Beyond the Uniform. There are over 200 free episodes at beyondtheuniform.io. They're classified by the industry of focus, the functional role the person plays, and more. Beyond the Uniform is hosted, produced, and edited by me, Justin Asiri. Our director of outreach, responsible for sponsorship and guest episodes, is Steve Bain. Our editor, responsible for the show notes and text transcripts for all episodes, is Kathleen Dillon. Our data analytics and insights advisor is Andrew Woolridge. If you are enjoying Beyond the Uniform, you can help us out by telling your veterans and friends in the military about this free resource. There is more information on the website about how you can sponsor an episode or donate to our program to help us grow the work that we're doing. Be sure to check out the coaching section of beyondtheuniform.io where you can be paired with professional, subsidized coaches to help you figure out your next career move. You can sign up for our newsletter to be up to date on the latest happenings at Beyond the Uniform. And in each show notes section, there is a link to audible.com, which is providing a free audiobook of your choice to Beyond the Uniform listeners. You get a free book of your choosing, and Beyond the Uniform gets $15 to subsidize the cost of the show, regardless of whether you can continue with audible.com or not. Check that out and more in the show notes for this episode. Keep the feedback coming. Let me know what resources would help you in your career, and we'll do our best to make that happen. Take care, be safe, and I'll be back next week with more interviews with military veterans about their civilian career.